Well, welcome, welcome back, everybody, um, to our second session of the Nomadic Image Conference. It's great to see you all back after lunch here. And I'm delighted to be joined now by Ulrika Alchamis, who you can see here on our screen. Ulrika is the uh, CEO and director of the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, in Canada. And she's joining us from Toronto, Canada, where it is extremely early in the morning. So we're delighted to have you with us, Ulrika. It is, um, the topic today is the Aga Museum Fostering Intercultural Dialogue and Peace to the arts of the Muslim world. Uh, Many of us here um, met up with Ulrika for our initial discussion in uh, Bishkek a couple of days ago at the National Museum of Fine Arts. And I can tell you, I think this is going to be a fascinating and really engaging talk. So Ulrika, over to you. Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone from Toronto. I will start by sharing my screen for you and set myself up. Um, as I want to tell you about my museum. Can you all see my screen? Good. So I would like to talk to you today a little bit about our museum, the Aga Khan Museum, and how we project intercultural dialogue through the arts into the world at large. But I would like to start with why a museum? and why Canada? Because often people think that a museum is a Western-centric idea that it came with colonial forces. But in reality, a museum is something that we all have in our houses, in our communities, in our heads, because communities all around the world don't only collect material things that are of importance to them, but they also collect memories, poetry, histories, genealogies, spiritual traditions. So we need to think of the concept of museum as a global thing, and not just as history tends to tell us in a very Western centric way that the concept originated in Europe with famous places like the Vatican museums in Rome that really were the oldest public museums in the 16th century. And then the even more famous British museum which opened in 1759 the uh, Louvre in Paris, 1793, and the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia, which opened to the public in, on two occasions in the 18th and 19th century. And we are often taught that these histories um, commence in palaces and in temples where the communities and civilizations collected what was relevant and important to them, but in places which largely were only open to the elite, of course, and not necessarily to the public at large. But could you have imagined that the oldest museum that we actually know about is in what we now call the Muslim world? It is an archeological site in the south of Iraq in a place called Ur, and it was discovered in an area that belongs to both a palace and a temple complex and was located right next to a school. And here we have a collection of clay objects that were found, some of them 2000 years old, with little clay labels right next to them, written in the language of the day and in the lettering of the day, which was called cuneiform. So museum exists everywhere around the world in all cultures. And in the, in the Islamic context, in the Muslim context, actually the first museum was the Kaaba at the heart of the Holy Mosque in Mecca because even from before the times of Islam, this was a pilgrimage area, a holy site to which people brought gifts and religious paraphernalia. And then of course, after the rise of Islam, religious manuscripts, textiles to cover the Kaaba 
and uh, beautiful objects to be used at the site for ritual and for the pilgrim's comfort and um, reverence of the holy place. And if you look at Islamic civilizations across time and space, including also palace cities like the round city of Baghdad established in the 8th century, the Medina de Zahra in Spain outside Cordoba, these palace cities were famous from the beginning for collections of art and also, most importantly, of manuscripts and of libraries. So even in those early days, rulers, the elite, princes, intellectuals prided themselves in having collections of material culture and literature that went into the tens of thousands. And people were proud at the sizes of their collections and their libraries. If we look at the Fatimid dynasty in Egypt, which ruled from the 10th to the 12th century, they had a massive treasury of which we know only from the sources because after the fall of the dynasty, of course, this treasury was looted and was distributed all over the Muslim world and also with some objects reaching the West and Europe. And we know that these treasuries contained precious jewelry, precious rock crystal, textiles, ceramics, jewelry. And these artifacts were brought together in part by diplomatic gifts that were given to the rulers, by objects that were handed down in the family and had very personal and spiritual relevance, loot from military campaigns, and also, of course, trade, because a treasury like that also symbolized the pride, the identity, and the wealth of the dynasty with a close eye on both friends and enemies in the royal um, context of the Muslim world, and even for the Fatimids, who, of course, ruled on the southern edge of the Mediterranean, uh, with an eye on their European friends and enemies. And wherever you go, even in uh, Turkey, and of course the Ottoman Empire was the largest Muslim empire for many centuries until actually the early 20th century, you have the Topkapi Sarai, which in turn was built on a Byzantine pre-Islamic Christian um, imperial palace city you have these treasuries that we can still uh, visit and appreciate to this very day. You also in the Muslim world have many, many religious sites that served and still serve as museums, like the Ardabil Shrine here um, in Iran, which even has little showcases or showcase niches let into the walls to receive precious objects like ceramics, like manuscripts and jewelry that were again given by the rulers themselves and uh, religious pilgrims to beautify the site and also in honor of the saint that was buried there. So museums are universal in the Muslim context. Muslim museums and collections have always been an integral part. But then why Canada? Why is the Aga Khan Museum in Canada? So the reason for that really is the vision of His Highness the Aga Khan, who said that in its origins, in its designs, and in its programs and activities, the museum is really intended to be a pluralistic platform, a platform where cultures, different religions come together to learn with each other, from each other. And in that respect, very much reflects the Ismaili values of his community as well. And Prince Amin emph emphasized further that I believe strongly that art and culture can have a profound impact in healing misunderstanding and in fostering trust even across great divides. This is the extraordinary purpose, the special mandate to which this museum 
is dedicated and cultural connection will be at the heart of the museum's mission to increase and illuminate the dialogue between different Muslim civilizations themselves and between those civilizations and non-Muslim civilizations. So basically, since its opening in September 2014, the museum has been dedicated to celebrating, showcasing the achievements and contributions of Muslim cultures, but then also their interconnectedness with the wider world. And of course, Canada in this respect is an important place and the city of Toronto as such, because both are dedicated to pluralism, to welcoming different cultures and integrating them into a pluralistic society where differences are valued and are seen as adding value to the society at large. So really a coming together of ethos and aspiration and vision. So we have just recently rethought what we want to be as a museum because the world is changing and our audiences need us, but they need us in different ways. They come not only to learn or to be educated, but they really also want to enjoy themselves and they want to do things themselves and want to be empowered to do things. So the way we look at ourselves today is that from our distinctive side and from our collection of masterpieces from Muslim civilizations, we want to spark wonder, curiosity and understanding by building bridges across cultures and promoting pluralism through art, stories, and enlightened encounter. And this says something already about the way that we want to use our objects. So we do this now in five different ways, focusing our activities towards different audiences. So first of all, we have a team that works on what we call the Winford site experience. Here you can see our museum, which is located in a beautiful park, um, uh, and connected to the Ismaili Center on the left with the Aga Khan Park, which is designed by Islam or inspired by Islamic gardens and Canadian flora and fauna. And this site is now used for outdoor, outdoor exhibitions and for intercultural festivals that we run every year to really bring people to the site, make them welcome, allow them to enjoy the gardens, and really mingle with each other, come together, especially after the COVID crisis, and get to know each other in an informal, relaxing, beautiful way. So here we have some examples of exhibitions, of course, always themed around um, topics from the Muslim world. We had an exhibition on Nowruz, an exhibition on the Silk Road, and we also empower contemporary artists from our city and further afield to display their works in the park, in dialogue with the park. We project um, animations onto the facade of the building. And these two are educational projects because we work with art students from our colleges in Toronto and universities and we empower them to engage with our collections, get inspired, and then create these new digital media projections for our, our audiences in the summer and in the winter. Now inside, we have our activities live at AKM. So here you have a vista into our atrium space, which we also now use for exhibitions. And as you can see, the little girl playing um, in the atrium as part of an art installation we had there during COVID. And of course, that is the engine of everything we do, starting with our permanent collection. We have about 1,200 art objects from 
North Africa to China and dating from the 7th to the 21st century. And the way that we look at our objects is that every single one of them can tell a multitude of different stories that go well beyond the usual one track curator label. So when you look at these two objects that I'm showing you here, for example, the astrolabe you see made of bronze and beautifully decorated with its scientific detail actually has an inscription that uh, or inscriptions that combine Arabic, Hebrew and Latin on one scientific instrument. And that, of course, symbolizes the coming together of different experts from different religions that lived and worked together and researched together and studied together, drove progress together in 14th century Toledo in Spain. At the same time, of course, it is the grand, 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 grandfather of our GPS navigation systems that we now have on our smartphones, because this wonderful instrument until the 17th, 18th century at least, was the foremost navigation tool to find your way across land and sea. When you look at the black, blue and white object um, on the right of the screen, this is actually a plate, a Chinese porcelain plate that was made in the era of uh, the Emperor Zheng De in the 16th century in Jingdezheng and was made very obviously for a Muslim market because you can see the inscription Taharat in the middle, which signifies purity and might indicate that this is an ablution basin. At the time, there were many uh, Muslim officials at court in China, but of course, these dishes were also traded across the world and then in turn engendered copies that were made in Persia because these Chinese porcelains arrived in Iran through the Gulf and were then copied locally to, um, to get in on the market for blue and white. They traveled all the way to uh, Europe where they were also copied. So already at that time, and of course that was already underway for thousands of years, we have a phenomenon we now call made in China. And it helps us to talk about globalization and the interconnectedness of arts, of ideas, of commodities, of philosophies, traveling across the world well before the modern realization of globalization, which only started in the 80s and 90s. So objects also give us an opportunity to connect the historical with the contemporary. We can also look at objects in a way that might talk about all of us and how we are interconnected in the globalized world. To give you an example of this, I would like to show you one of our most famous objects, this beautiful ivory horn, which art historians attribute to Egypt, Sicily, or Southern Italy in or around the 12th century. It's considered a piece of Islamic art, but think about it differently. First of all, it is made of ivory, and this ivory came from trading centers south of the Sahara Desert in Africa, perhaps from centers like Gao in Mali or Kumbi Saleh. And these ivory horns were, of course, collected by African uh, hunters and were then carried by Arab and Berber, non-Muslim, Muslim traders, across the Sahara Desert to the Southern Mediterranean coast, and from there distributed by Italian and Greek merchants all across the Mediterranean to centers in Muslim and Christian uh, lands. So as you can see, the ivory horn is carved, and there's discussion where that happened, but if they were carved in Egypt, which under the which at the time was under Muslim rule, under Fatimid rule, 
the Kaabas would have been Christian Copts, not Muslims, because they were the experts on carving ivory and wood from ancient times and their skill and, and craftsmanship continued to be valued under another religious rulership. The images that were carved into the horn of hunters, of heroes defeating demons and snakes, was a visual language that was shared by Muslim and Christian royalty all around the Mediterranean at the time. And everyone would have understood the symbolism. Now, the horn disappears in some, at some point in the 12th century, and we don't know what happened to it. But 500 years later, it turns up in England, in Norfolk, at the wedding of a young English aristocratic couple. And it is at that time that the silver fittings are added, possibly by a Jewish English silversmith, and the decoration symbolizes the heraldic signs of both the families that were joined in matrimony on that occasion. And at that point also, the horn that in, in its original times served as a hunting horn or a processional horn, so it was used for blowing on special occasions, it changes its function and it becomes a drinking horn. So it then stays in the family for hundreds of years until eventually it uh, enters the art market in the 20th century, is also displayed in Islamic art exhibitions, then eventually makes its way to Geneva, and then eventually to Toronto. So isn't this object a beautiful symbol for the trajectory of a globalized human being where we all ultimately start somewhere pure, uncarved, and then we move. Perhaps we want to move, but perhaps we have to move. And we are taken to other places far away. And on the way, we are carved symbolically speaking, by our experiences, by other people impacting us and changing us and enriching us. And as we go through life and as we go through different places, perhaps even travel and go around the world and end up somewhere else, we also change who we are and we become this ever richer being with more and more experiences and different outlooks on the world. So I also see our objects as having the potential to make us think about who we are and how we go through life and how our experiences shape us. Look at this manuscript from the 17th century made in Isfahan. It is a copy of the Masnavi by Jalaluddin Rumi, who was, of course, a refugee and an asylum seeker because he started off in what is now Afghanistan, but then had to leave his homelands as a child with his parents when the Mongols started invading um, the eastern flank of the Islamic empire. And the family was pushed westwards and was displaced again and again, had to go to Mecca, they went to Damascus, and eventually he ended up in Konya, uh, Anatolia, Turkey. And here he sat down as an outsider, as a refugee, and he started writing. And eventually created one of the greatest poetic and spiritual masterpieces in the world today. And not only was his work honored and copied again and again over centuries within the Muslim world, like this beautiful uh, manuscript we have from Isfahan, but today in North America, for one, Rumi is the most famous translated poet of them all. So an artwork like this can remind you of what an outsider, a refugee, 
an asylum seeker, a migrant, can achieve in his or her new environment. And it can serve as an inspiration to all those who are trying to make a new life and a new purpose far, far away from home. Of course, we also involve contemporary artists and we bring them in to respond to our historical collections. We recently had two wonderful artists. One is a Ghanaian Torontonian artist from originally from Ghana in Africa, Eko Nimaku. And he works with black Lego pieces to create um, alternative history sculptures to reflect a visionary Afrofuturistic um, vision of the world. So we had a historical exhibition about the fundamental importance of the continent of Africa to world history and world economy well before the colonials arrived in the 16th century. And we invited him to react to the historical pieces on this play. And he came up with this phenomenal Afrofuturistic civilization piece. It's called Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE. And it was displayed in our permanent gallery and we actually acquired it for our permanent collection because we want to make the very important point that Islamic art, Muslim art, from the Muslim world and beyond now did not just end in the past. It continues, it is vibrant and contributes today in a globalized world. On the right, you see the stained glass of an Iranian uh, Torontonian artist who again reacted to our uh, collection and considered the invisible terms and conditions that come to play in a museum and that restrict and control the objects, but also the visitors moving through the space. And among those invisible forces, of course, are light, which has to be regulated to keep objects safe, um, but also um, control mechanisms that affect the way people move, that affect the, the environmental conditions, humidity, uh, airflow, and so on and so on. And her artwork commented on these hidden terms and conditions that um, come to play in any museum. We also, of course, do uh, temporary exhibitions. The most recent one was image question mark, the power of the visual. What is very important is when you have a collection of historical objects to make the case for their continuing contemporary relevance, because most people today are detached from historical collections. They don't understand anymore what their value is. They are often seen as elitist, as detached from the interests and needs of ordinary people. And that is a danger because if people don't value their heritage anymore, they might dispose of it, they might destroy it. So it's crucial to make the point for continuing relevance. So with these exhibitions, we try to do that. And of course, a very crucial um, topic within the arts of the Muslim world, but also at large is image. Most people in the Western world have an impression that Muslim civilizations don't have images to start with. And there's a lot of um, controversy around that, of course. But then also the English word image means my image of something, my perception of something, my understanding of something, the image of Muslims that people have, the image that you have of your friend or your enemy, the image you have of the West or of a particular country. So how we designed this exhibition was actually to think about the universal obsession that humanity has always had in projecting and visualizing big ideas um, through the arts. So 
everyone everywhere in the world has always projected power through images, spirituality through images, ideas and ideals through images, identity through images. And we used case studies from the Muslim world to talk about that. So here I'm giving you an example of an Ottoman Sultan that is projecting his uh, image of power to those who are looking at the artwork. Then you have a hero from an Iranian manuscript uh, and an image of heroism, what the ideal hero, the ideal leader should be. And then in the center, a contemporary work that was made by a Pakistani artist, Rashid Rana, for the exhibition. And if you look closely, it is on the one hand um, 80, a 19th century portrait of one of the French pioneers of photography. But when you look closely, this image is made up of thousands of colorful selfies that people submitted for this artwork. And of course, nowadays we are so obsessed with images. They are all around us on television, on our smartphones that we no longer reflect the power of these images to influence us, to manipulate us, to make us have an image of others, a perception of others. And therefore it is crucially important to stop again and reflect the meaning and the power of images on us today because in our fraught world, we need to be mindful. We need to be careful about what we are looking at and what that image needs to say to us or wants to say to us. We also have started touring some of our um, exhibitions. So this is a touring exhibition called Don't Ask Me Where I Am From. And it incorporates the work of 15 contemporary artists that come from completely intercultural backgrounds. So they come from mixed families, they were born somewhere and live somewhere else, they move between continents, they move between languages, between cultures, and they are commenting on what it means to be the permanent in-betweener and the opportunities and advantages that come from that, but also the difficulties when you don't fit into a particular box that people want to put you into. We've also taken our objects and the themes that come from our objects onto the web and into the digital space. So we are now projecting our ideas through a podcast called This Being Human. And it makes available the stories and voices of contemporary Muslim personalities, because one of the tragedies of the Muslim world and Muslim civilizations is that the Western centric narrative around them stops in the 18th, 19th century. And then nobody hears about Muslim contributions anymore. And of course, despite political upheaval, dis despite uh, environmental disaster and epidemics, um, contributions never stopped. There have always been artists, scientists, scholars, doctors, inventors. And it is crucial that we continue this dialogue and continue telling their stories and making their voices heard in a globalized world that is dominated by a Western-centric uh, narrative and Western-centric discourse. We also have started working with digital art and um, actually during the COVID crisis, premiering uh, a digital artwork online. So this lady you see here is called Radha Chada. She is both a microbiologist and an artist and she created um, a digital artwork that combines animation, music, cinematography, dance, um, engagement with the natural environment to talk about how the COVID virus has affected human individuals, the human body, the natural environment and the universe at large. 
And then of course, most importantly, our objects are engines for intercultural education. And again, through the COVID crisis, when we were closed for most of 2021 and 2022, um, or early 2022, we took our teaching online and we developed new concepts and formats that really, again, make the case for historical objects as important conversation starters for contemporary topics. So here you see a manual we developed around well-being. We also did a um, teacher's toolkit for uh, contemplating Islamic artworks as starting points for considering four of the sustainable development goals, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We taught internationally. So um, I did recently two virtual classrooms and virtual tours of the museum for students that were sitting in Tanzania, Kenya, Mozambique, and India. And they were all in the same classroom taking a virtual tour in the Museum of Islamic Art around still life painting. So now you might think, what is she doing? Because still life painting is a very Western art form. And that was exactly my point to the teacher when she approached me, because I said, why are you teaching Western still life painting when these children from Africa and South Asia have such rich artistic uh, cultures in their own backyards? But then I explained to her that when you look at the concept of still life, what actually is that? It's an artist bringing together items of meaning in their cultures and combining them into a composition that in turn wants to say something, wants to communicate. And when you peel the concept back to those basics, every country in the world has still lives. So I took the students through the museum on the virtual platform and gave them three, four case studies of still lives from Muslim civilizations. And I'm telling you this story because what is also needed is to open up the discourse around concepts and narratives that are now universally accepted, are now uni in universal curricula around the world but which ultimately, again, reflect Western-centric approaches and do not make space for alternative narratives, local narratives, indigenous narratives. And they have to be unlocked. Um, traditional concepts have to be challenged, have to be globalized. And that is what we are trying to do through our global teaching and through developing new concepts and formats around that. And then we have started working on uh, futuristic ways of educating as well. So we are working with a local university here, the Toronto Metropolitan University on a Minecraft game, which is an online game for children. And we are hoping to develop this in a way that high school students from all over the world can use our museum, our park and our objects to ultimately come together and um, build their identities and build a better world. We've also invited the public in to talk about their objects and what they mean to them. Again, opening up the narratives, broadening the narratives. And I would like to finish my talk with showing you um, a video and you have to forgive me, I just have to stop sharing and resharing uh, to jump to the video for you. So just give me a second while I do this. Um, let me see how I get out of this for you. And this shows you one example of how the public talk about our objects. Every time I reflect on my experience at the Aga Khan Museum, I'm always reminded of these two tiles with iris plants painted on them from Isfahan, Iran during the 17th century. 
The piece has beautiful, vivid colors and such detailed drawings of these iris plants that you can really tell that the artist cared about the natural world. I too, as a geology student, am constantly caring about the environment and looking around me to ask how the world came to be. It's so fascinating to think that the planet can both be so creative and destructive at the same time, and that we as humans rely so deeply on these natural processes. The artist not only is depicting these flowers, but using the materials of clay and soil to create the tiles that the artist relies so deeply on. So not only is this a depiction of the natural world, but it needs the environment to be a piece. I also love the work because it reminds me of my grandparents living in Iran. They're farmers who also rely on the environment to produce food for themselves and to make a living. And when I look at this piece, I'm reminded of them and all the hard work that they do day in and day out. I also love this work because it reminds me of my experience with Iran and visiting cities like Isfahan. Going as a young girl, my memories of the place are fragmented and scattered. This piece too are tile fragments of a larger panel that once stood during the booming Safavid period. My memories are, are piecemeal, like these tiles, but they still remind me of a great time that I reflect on always. So I love to look at this piece and I love to think about my connection to the natural world and the artist's love for the environment and how we too today can still cherish this piece and create these great memories of the past and the present. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Ulrika. That was, as always, inspirational and fascinating. I, for one, could listen to Ulrika talk for an hour further. <laughs> uh, we have a few minutes here. Um, does anybody have a question uh, for Ulrika or a comment? We, we've got one here from Peter. Peter Wagner. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much. That was um, a very interesting, informative and thought provoking lecture. I just want to ask you one question, uh, because it indeed provoked a thought. Uh, your um, initiative, uh, don't ask me where I'm coming from, um, it provokes the thought whether this is not in a way an inescapable question. Because if I understood you correctly, uh, you were also saying that you were looking for people who don't come from one place, they come from more than one or they have moved in between. So you had to ask them where they are coming from and you wanted an answer, which means not from one place, but from more than one. So maybe <laughs> it's inescapable in the end. Yes, and of course, it's a very beautiful question. I mean, many people here are hesitant to ask someone from somewhere else, where are you from? Because sometimes, of course, these people are from here. And by asking them, where are you from? You are implying that you don't think that they belong here, that they must come from somewhere else. But I personally love that question very much because it gives you the opportunity to learn about somebody's trajectory. And while there will be specificities, there will also always be connecting points. And that is the crucial thing at this time in particular that we need to urgently uh, reconnect human connection beyond differences. And we are often focused too much on what divides us or what distinguishes us from other people rather than looking for those connecting points that actually unite us and we all have them you can start here in Toronto in particular you start a conversation with anyone from anywhere and it doesn't take you more than one minute to have an actual connection with that person somehow so it's more about finding um, or using in our case because we are talking about museums and artworks um, using an object to unlock a conversation that then allows two people that normally wouldn't talk to each other for different reasons um, to realize that they have common ground and that they actually share more than they are aware of. 
And we have another question here. Thank you very much. Um, you um, mentioned Jalal Din Rumi. Uh, and uh, as you know, in Central Asia, we have a uh, philosophy uh, like um, Sufism, uh, Sufis. Mm. Uh, so uh, Agahan Museum uh, in Canada, did you have any exhibition uh, dedicated to Sufism and Sufi philosophers? And my second, uh, uh, like uh, uh, you mentioned my Minecraft uh, game, uh, like you know, museums are always in the city center or in the somewhere in big cities, metropolitan, and how to make it closer to kids, to students, uh, to bring museums to uh, schools or to institutions. This is one way to do interactive 3D virtual tours or to do Minecraft to develop new games or mobile applications. And uh, also, can we uh, ask uh, our Kyrgyzstani universities to do virtual tour to Agahan Museum in Canada? Uh, and so these these are my two like <laughs> questions. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, interestingly, the next year we are doing a, sh a show on Rumi, and what we are actually doing is keeping the historical objects, which anyway are very rare, relating to Rumi to a minimum and using them as um, starting points for introducing three contemporary artists from areas that Rumi lived and worked in. So Iran, Turkey and Afghanistan. And they will create new work in the gallery in response to being inspired by Rumi and by Sufism. So we are doing that. And in terms of collaborating with Kyrgyz universities, no problem at all. You know, we can do virtual tours wherever. And um, we can also arrange around topics that might be of interest to you, um, uh, virtual classrooms where we bring together students from different parts of the world, because that is the wonderful thing now through the digital platforms that we can actually bring young people together across borders, across cultural divides, and let them experience something together and talk to each other about something that uh, they are all interested or care about or share, like, you know, environment, um, water, sustainability, whatever their contemporary concerns are, because what, again, we don't realize is in this fractured world that we all have many, many concerns we share wherever we are. And rather than pitching us against each other, we should realize we need to tackle things together and we can only do that if we start talking to each other. And arts is a wonderful medium to actually unlock that conversation and allow different voices to come to the table around something we share. Thanks, Ulrika. We have time, I think, for just one more question, if anybody. You, you've got a follow-up question. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> value for money. There you go. Um, recently on social media, we had a discussion in, here in Kyrgyzstan uh, regarding uh, Isla, uh, Islam. Uh, as a, In Islam, uh, they believe that Allah creates everything, like uh, dogmatic uh, thinking, like uh, humans maybe cannot invent something new, like uh, creating creative thinking. Is it possible in Muslim or is it yeah. not possible? So this is a huge like a, a question. Like, and what is your opinion regarding this creativity in Islam? Well, you know, um, the Prophet himself said, "Look for knowledge, even if have to, if you have to go all the way to China." So um, knowledge was always at the heart of Muslim culture, particularly because only through knowledge could you really fathom the infinity and perfection of the universe, right? So there is lots of evidence in, this, in the Quran and in religious scriptures that actually encourage people to research, to learn, to read. I mean, the first command in Islam is Iqra, <coughs> which means read, right? And um, many people, they use it as recite, 
which is one interpretation, but reciting is only at the surface. But ikhra also means read, and read means study and means researching, right? So absolutely, um, everything that was done uh, in, in scientific endeavor was ultimately has always been uh, getting more humble and knowledgeable about God's universe. Thanks very much, Ulrika. Um, yeah, the, the commandment to read and to educate ourselves is certainly something we've been doing here, and you've been a wonderful leader in that this afternoon. Ulrika was originally going to come and join us here in Narin, and uh, we're very disappointed when she couldn't make it for various reasons, but we do hope, Ulrika, that this is the beginning of a conversation here with UCA, and that we will welcome you here one day. But for the I would love that. Thank you very much indeed. Please join me in welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And um, I believe it's five o'clock in the morning where you are. So uh, yeah, I'll go back to bed. Now. Back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.